Welcome all to our Highlights Foundation Gather. We're grateful to have Sarah Aronson and Matali Perkins with us today. We'll have time to listen to Sarah and Matali in conversation, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions by using the Q&A feature. Sarah Aronson is our weekly HF Gather host. She teaches many courses at the Highlights Foundation and beyond. She is a stickler for a well-rounded character and an expert in the art of mentorship. Sarah writes everything from picture books through YA and just finished her adult draft. Welcome once again to our dear friend, Sarah Aronson. Matali Perkins is the special guest today. This is not a drill. It is Matali Perkins. I'm so excited. <laughs> Matali's work is lyrical and magical. She too writes everything from picture books through novels. It's um, perhaps a modest showing in the industry of love of her work. You know, things like movie adaptations and National Book Award nomination and honors and starred reviews. But really it's the voice of those storytellers that she creates that we connect the most with. I think about the observers of the world that are in You Bring the Distant Near, those women that we follow them through this story of family and immigration and love, or Katina King and Forward Me Back to You, where we find friendship and healing, and then we get to that place of hope with Kat that we so desperately need. Um, Matali's books are just stunning and beautiful, and I'm going to put lots of links to them in the chat today for you. Um, we have two wonderful writers here with us today and two amazing, amazing women. So thank you both so much for being here. Let's get started. All right. Hello, everyone. If this is your first HF Gather, um, I'm Sarah. And this chat is usually about three things that start with C. Community, the foundation of everything we do. Um, and it's really nice to have Mitali here because Mitali was one of the first writers that I met when I was first starting out in New, in New England when I lived there. And hearing her speak uh, was always really inspiring for me. So community, creativity, and curiosity. Those three pillars are what these conversations have been about. And I know today we're gonna to have a wonderful time. So um, before we get started, Natalie, if you would close your eyes for a second so I can show everyone the word of the day. This word is a word I think I've used before. And it's also, remember, I've got a running thing going. You can uncover now um, that um, no one ever says it. So let's cross our fingers. If you say it, everybody drink. Okay, your tea. Come on, people. It's early. Let's get started. Um, I'd like to ask you about your process right now during this time where we are staying at home and how you're keeping the flame going. What's, is there anything working that hasn't worked before or anything you're relying on that worked in the past that has really become even more important? Oh, it's good to be with you all today. Uh, Sarah, thank you for that question. Um, I've been hearing that there's been a glut of potatoes on the market. The Belgian potato farmers really need us to continue to consume. So I've been doing my part. So my continued um, eating potato chips, salt and vinegar potato chips, my go-to substance has continued, maybe upped a bit more. Um, so keeping the flame alive, especially through something stressful, we've been going through a stressful change personally, as well as this, this community global thing that we're all going through. So um, just to, I've been trying to write every day. I start the day with quiet. I've been trying to write in my journal. I've been trying to do all the practices that I try to put in place during my regular writing life have really served me here. So um, putting away the phone, I don't have a phone in my room at night, not tuning into all of that, that craziness before I go to sleep. So the last thing I think of at night is um, something, maybe poetry or something else. So all those practices, one day a week, I'm off my phone. Those are really helping me, even though it, I still, I feel the level of, I can feel the level of anxiety by the number of potato chips I'm consuming are <laughs> going. So I, it's not that I don't feel the anxiety, it's that what I had in place before, I think is really 
helping me now. And I'm grateful for those practices that I had in place before. You know, writing is a practice and those exactly what you're talking about, you know, doing those morning pages, journaling and talking with a, writing with a pencil um, have become so much more important to me since all of this started because I, kn I know I can depend on them. Um, I also feel like we're so overconnected that getting off the screen and um, focusing on just the page and the words has been um, like a sanctuary. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the good thing about the pandemic has been the incredible outpouring of creativity. So I find that other people's creativity fuels my own creativity. So whether it be, you know, Yo-Yo Ma playing his cello for us at night or these incredible choirs that are joining together or uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber putting his musicals on YouTube for free. And this is this gift that artists are bringing to us in this time and other people feeding on that and it's been really inspiring. And so mostly musicians and visual artists watching their process, that, that's been really, uh, life giving to me as a creative is what seeing how creatives are rising up to serve the, the people around us who are and how art art can really serve people who are who are suffering uh because that's always a question right how how do we artists who sit in our computer for hours how are we serving the, the world when the world is going through painful time and so it's been very encouraging to see that art really does matter even more deeply in these times and having those um, performances and paintings come into our rooms and through the screen has um, given us a window to vulnerability that I think, you know, who would think that Andrew Lloyd Webber would feel a little insecure at the piano? And yet he's tender and tentative and in a lovely way that all of us are when we begin to share our art spontaneously. Yes, it takes that courage and, it, and we've been seeing other people do that, you know, in their own homes without all the studio and the makeup and the just to be able to share their art has been so that's been the upside has been being a feeding my own creative soul with those people's offerings, as you said, vulnerable, messy, not perfect, uh, not finished and polished. That's been really great to see that. Yeah, not, getting away from perfect has been sort of a lifetime pursuit for me not because i am have ever felt perfect but hard because, you, Sarah. you're so close <laughs> yeah yeah always so close but it is but it's like that 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 um yearning for product when what we really want is process and what and that that vulnerability and uncertainty is sort of the engine not the thing to be not the thing to fear but the thing to pursue and so I, I always find those contradictions to be so comforting when I see others grappling with them. I think, oh yeah, stay away from the product. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about where you're ending. Worry about where you're going. Yes, I love that. I love process versus product because, um, and I think that's really important both uh, personally as well as creatively. That that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the only way to, I mean, I guess it's the only way for me to look at it. I'm always um, really interested when people can, can think in terms of the full product as they are in the process. I have never been able to do that. Every time I do that, I get stuck. So. Right. And if you look back at human history, it seems like times of trial and suffering and uh, really have refined art and have brought the best out of artists. So you know, we're not very good as a culture, I think, to endure uh, deprivation or self-sacrifice. We're just not good at it. So this season has been I think, a really good honing. Not, I'm not just, the ends never justify the means. I know it's been a hard time, but I think some of the beauty of art that we'll see as a result of this, especially among the younger generation, the creative. I remember when I was home in my, as a kid, and I, we didn't have TV because uh, we were new immigrants and we just didn't have TV. So I just got bored, crazy bored in the summers. And, and that's when I started writing my little poems. And so I'm hoping this whole new generation who are bored out of their minds are turning to maybe some of those, that creative, especially with words, the, those of us who, who draw rather, I mean, who write rather than draw. Yeah. I'm hoping there's some poets to emerge from this. I'm going to say this again. I totally agree. Um, you, 
boredom, I think, has, is an underrated um, ingredient to creativity. The other thing I've been finding about this space is that it used to be that if I was having a bad writing day, well, that became, I had only a limited amount of time. But now, because of boredom and not having much to do, I can rebound. So my writing day is not compacted into one space. I can find writing time in the afternoon or in the evening um, where I used to not have that. So right. I, and I miss the kids. <laughs> yeah, as you're talking though, I, I remember the, one of the hardest things as a writer when you don't write, you have a bad writing day, you spend all your time on Twitter, you know, instead of writing, um, yes. you end up with this kind of self-loathing, like, oh, I suck, I'm, I'm just the worst, and I'm never gonna, oh, you know, so-and-so is such a more disciplined than me, and they're up at five writing, and I'm just wasting time, and so the great, another great outcome of the pandemic is this wealth of therapeutic affirmation, <laughs> Like, it's okay if you don't create, be good to yourself, put on your weighted blanket and eat your potato chips. We all are. So this, this license to just be, uh, you know, not be productive, license to not be productive as part of the creative process is in our community, you know, throughout all of us. And so I'm getting that message from the outside. So when I get that, oh, you suck, Vitaly, you didn't write today. I'm like, it's okay. I got all these roses telling me it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I think that we've all really mastered being kind to others. Being kind to others and having empathy, we've been talking about that for a long time. But being kind to ourselves, that has not been something that we've been willing to do. And I think now we are finally seeing that being kind to ourselves and lowering the bar has opened up ways of being creative that we did not think we were open to us. Right. It's almost, uh, it reminds me of, uh, I've, I've, our, our children are adopted, so I've never been pregnant. But I remember, well, I have a good friend right now who's about, who's due May 22nd. And just watching her, how when you're pregnant, you're being and doing at the same time. You're doing all this incredible work of another human being nurtured inside of you, but you don't have to do anything. And then, and then there's this time where, so I'm, all, I'm feeling like this is that communal creative pregnancy that we're all and I'm hoping, again, I'm hoping for this great outpouring of beautiful fiction and nonfiction and poetry and art that's going to emerge from this pregnant pause that we are, we're all in. I, I hope so, too, and I look forward to it. Um, I would like to um, talk to you about this crazy thing you have been doing, moving. Uh, um, at this time, um, I can't even, I, I'm in awe. Um, how is it going? And let's... Let's just take it a step further. How is moving like writing or revising a book? Oh gosh, Sarah, it's, it's very similar in some ways. A lot of hard physical labor uh, for the moving part, but I think you, you know, that's a great metaphor. Thanks for that question, because it's helped me to see um, that it is similar. You, you do a lot of getting rid of stuff and purging and, uh, I was able to get all my stuff to Goodwill before Goodwill got inundated and <laughs> shut down. So we purged like crazy. So that part was hard. But again, when you get rid of stuff in a, in a novel and you just focus on the important things and you, you condo your novel, you condo your house, you know, that, uh, that is, that's, it's very similar. It's tiring, it's exhausting, it's consuming. And then you start to put back pieces, like I was saying behind me, um, I just put this up yesterday, my husband did for me, and it was, they're paintings that are drawn by, that were painted by a young woman I met in Calcutta who was rescued from trafficking and she was in an aftercare home. And so I bought two of her paintings and I put them up, they connect to my novel, one of my novels and the themes. And so I put the art up and, and that's, again, you add the pieces that are important, that are vital to you and to your life. So yeah, so it's very similar. It's hard, it's arduous, it's emotional. You know, there's things that you, I, I remember when I was in the packing stage, the hardest stage was the packing. And I was walking around with an umbrella and a picture of our boys from when they were babies. And I was like, yeah. I, I, I might need this umbrella. I was just walking around for half an hour holding an umbrella and a picture of our boy. And it's just so emotional and hard. It's been hard, Sarah. I'm not, I won't deny that it's not been a really uh, intense passage, but we're kind of coming on the other side now. So thanks, it, it, thanks, it, thanks it, for it, that. It, it, 
may, I'm about to go into a revision. It made me think about when, when we were moving to Evanston, Illinois from New England, um, how I decided to pack was, what are the things I will be delighted to find in my box? And what are the things that if I open them and find them in the box, I'm gonna go like, you gotta deal with this again. So I'm trying to do that with my draft. I'm saying to each chapter, are you a chapter I would be delighted to open? Or are you a chapter that like, what a drudgery, why did I save you? And, and that, that focus has helped me get rid of about 12,000 words. <laughs> That's so courageous, good for you. That's awesome, that's really good work. It's hard, you need to be ruthless. The good thing about revising, unlike Goodwill, is that you, you'll never see your things again, but with your, the things that you are ruthless, you have to think of being ruthless in the present to serve your future self, you know, so, as you said. So, but with revising, you can always do that save as thing and, and then think, and it's not as painful, like I can, these beautiful lyrical passages that I, my characters sit around for a long time drinking tea, and I, and I have these long, beautiful, lyrical passages, and I think, oh, I want to keep them. But to be ruthless for the sake of my future self and also my future reader, at least I can save as, right? I am not a saver. I feel like I, I am a slasher and a burner and a see you later alligator. Oh, you're brave. <laughs> <laughs> percent of the time I don't regret it. Every once in a while I think oh, I really like that sentence, but usually something usually I don't regret it. I feel like that I would I think that's that process of a product is that if I had a beautiful sentence, I would want so badly to keep it that I would write around it and getting rid of it leaves me free to re-explore and reimagine. Right. I think I like keeping the earlier drafts on my computer, whether it's beautiful writing or not, to remind me of the process because my second novel, Sarah, was rejected so many times. It took 11 years between my first and my second novel. Wow. So I had 22 maybe publishers after significant revisions rejected. So I kept all of those just as an encouragement to show me that I can do it. I can be ruthless in revision. So that's kind of, I don't, I rarely read them again, but. I, I hope, I hope everyone heard that. 11 years. 11 years between book one and book two. Wow. Two. Yeah. Determination. Uh, I, I, I always tell people that that's when I look back and think I must have really wanted it because I think anybody sane would have given up with the rejection 18, huge revision rejection, huge revision rejection. And I didn't, looking back, I think I didn't give up. So that perseverance must mean either a calling of some sort or a desire of some sort, a longing. And that's when it really honed my desire. And I, and I think my calling to be a writer was during that season where I didn't give up. Why didn't I, I usually give up? I, I give up on a lot of things, but I didn't give up on my writing. But you did, but you did write a number of things in between. So how did, were there, were there novels or things that went into a drawer that since you have re revisited or were you growing one, one story through that time? Yeah, I, I wrote different things. In fact, you bring the distant near, which Allison referred to, um, which, which was, I uh, was a compilation of a lot of things I wrote during that season. It was, a, I pulled those short stories, the memoir pieces, pieces out of my own life that I didn't, that didn't see the light of day and I compiled them, revised them and made them all into one narrative arc, which was wonderful to see those things being used after that season of rejection. But yeah, but not everything. Sometimes it was just like, I, this is how I use social media. Sometimes I just write for the fun of it, for the joy of it. And uh, that's, that's never gonna probably last, but still it's just, it gets the play back. I had to keep the play alive during that season of rejection. And still now, you know, you know, Sarah, you write a book, you think, oh, I got an agent, yay. Oh, I got a publisher, yay. And then there's always, you know, the, then that the book comes out, yay. And then there's that review that you, you know, those no bad review you get or the lack of sales. And then bit by bit, the book goes out of print. I mean, this journey of writing is full of what could be mortal blows, you know, unless you really know that you're called to it and that you want it. So you have to steal yourself not to measure the, the 
craft by those blows. You have to steal yourself to say the blows will come, but there's joy in the craft, there's play, there's fun. This is what I was designed to do. And dang it, I'm gonna keep doing it until my last breath, my last breath. So that's, that's. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I thought that, you know, when I first had a little success, I thought, oh, now everything's gonna go like this. Mm. So easy. It's gonna be so much easier each time. And I'm, and it's gonna be, and what has been comforting as well as challenging is that it's not. And yeah. I like that about it, is that each book presents new challenges. Each character um, is either easy or hard to get to know. They surprise me. Um, and, and being successful is, you know, on the spectrum. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, as long as I can keep doing this, I'm pretty happy. I know. Well, that's it. That's why if you are in a season panelist of rejection or discouragement or disappointment, because believe me, it'll come. It'll come even when you think you're established. You've got to fuel the joy of the craft and you've got to really go back inside yourself to see how much you were designed to do this. And then that will shift, that has to fuel you through the whole career. Otherwise you're gonna get some knocks and you're gonna, so if this is a season of disappointment and rejection, recover the play of it, the joy of it, the fun of it, the improving of your craft. And, and even just if you do a 10 minute, if you're stuck, boy, have I been stuck and you just cannot write and you're just discouraged, that self-loathing voice is back. You can do what I do, Sarah, which is I do this 10 minute writing burst. I don't know if any of you have ever tried. I do the burst. Study. Yeah, the power of habit, right? That anytime you want to break a bad habit or add a new practice, you, you trick your brain with this 10 minute, you set a timer and you say, I'm just going to write for 10 minutes. And I don't care what it is, it's going to be garbage. I'm just going to write it. And it actually works like a great, I call it, what do I call I think uh, Sue Campbell Bar, Sue, we were talking about the, the laxative, the, the creative laxative of the 10 minute verse, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it allows you to sort of just get it out and get back into the fun of it. And you lose your time. And all of a sudden, 10 minutes are gone and you think, this is fun again. So I would encourage you guys to recover the fun of it if you're in that season of disappointment. I cannot um, recommend that enough. I, when I hit my season of disappointment, um, actually, I was at Highlights. And doing the work that, um, you know, the work of my soul, which was helping other writers. And, um, and working with them and trying to be inspiring to them. And in that moment where I had to question myself, I challenged myself to play. And I challenged myself to do what I thought I could not do. And actually that's what I've been doing during, the, during this time period. Our, I've been writing things that I thought, no one's expecting this from me. And that has given me permission. Everybody, you have permission to explore things that um, feel maybe a little dangerous, feel a little reckless, feel a little bit fun and childlike. Okay, so Sarah, you finished your no adult novel. I'm so excited. Is it a, like a steamy, like with a cover, with a cleavage on the cover kind of novel? No, the main character is a grandma and oh. a Jewish grandma and it's a murder in the assisted living. But there is a, there is a steamy scene. <laughs> oh, I love steamy senior scenes. Those are the best. <laughs> Good for you. It was the most fun to write. It's the only scene that I think I'm embarrassed to share with my mother. So <laughs> she, my mom is really excited to see this. And, I, and I'm like, oh, maybe she could skip that scene. So, I know, that's so good. But, it, but what's been really interesting is that writing in an adult point of view has reminded me that when we write in a kid point of view, we're not writing as adults looking back at kids. We have to get into the head of that child. So as you have written a memoir, talk to me about finding the voice and the heart of the child, not just in, you know, as an adult looking back, but how did you... How did you enter that, re-enter that world in art? Uh, you mean to write as a child character? Yeah. Yeah. That for me is, that's why I write for children, I think. It's a natural, my natural voice. I, I think I'm stuck. 
I would say between the ages of eight and 14, just naturally, I'm very, that's me. And uh, I have written nonfiction for adults. I'm working on a nonfiction book for adults right now. But uh, when it comes to fiction, that's just my voice. I, I love the immediacy of childhood. I love the coming of age. I, uh, you know, mine was a difficult coming of age and I, uh, being an immigrant and all that stuff and all the culture code switching I had to do. And so that is just where I land in my voice. And voice is one of those things I'm not sure you can, you can teach really, but I do try to imagine myself in somebody else's skin all the time when I write my characters. And so, uh, and I don't know, I spend a lot of time with children. I, I don't think there's, but I think just that's my natural voice, Sarah. I guess that's, that's discouraging because you can't quite craft, I can't craft my way there. When I try to write an adult voice, people will often, editors will say, she sounds childish or this sounds young or even, even upper YA, I, I have my elderly mom too, like yours. They'd probably be friends because they could be like, um, chat about how proud they are of their daughters, right? And, um, but my mom, you know, she, I can't have, I can't write anything beyond a kiss. My mom would be like, you know, and I have a lot of Muslim readers and overseas. And so, I, I don't know, when I try to write upper YA, uh, people will often say, this sounds like middle school. And that's kind of where I'm stuck. I, I, middle school, seventh grade was the worst year of my life. I barely survived it. So I think I'm just sort of stuck for that seventh and eighth grade reader. That's just me. Is there, is there a ritual that you start each day with to help you get into that voice? Because your, your writing is, I mean, it's just, you know, it's childlike, it's beautiful. So is there, is there an exercise that we can do that you have learned really works to help you get into, into that spot? Yes, I have a great uh, exercise that I do um, and I call it uh, uh, creating a scene. And I would recommend that you do it with memory. Um, so I would say what I do is I try to remember a particular place where I was. If you read the opening preface or prologue to You Bring the Distant Near, it's where I started. It was a swimming pool in Accra, Ghana in Africa when I was about eight years old. Uh, and I have a, this, this visceral memory of that place, the steamy air and the sounds of the British voices. And so I, I know the place, you pick a place from your past where you have a kind of a strong memory and then just write down that place. And then the three P's, I noticed somebody else talking about four P's, which is good. So this is three P's. So you've got place. And then I try to encourage um, you to think of yourself in that. And so you put yourself down, Natalia, age 10 or eight, and then some emotion, some strong emotion. So we don't have time for plot in this create a scene, 10 minute writing burst, which I do, I do this as a workshop. I've done it at Highlight several times. Some of you might remember this uh, who, are, who are chatting. Um, and then, so instead of plot, because usually, you know, the scenes are in the middle of a, a big plot. For this exercise, I would say, just pick the emotion you're feeling. So for me, it would be Accra, Ghana at a British club swimming pool. Um, that's the place. The person is me at age eight. And I pick the other people in the scene as well. My mom, my sister. And then the third thing would be the emotion. And it was, it moved from disappointment, I mean, hope to intense disappointment. That was in that scene. And then I just write it as a 10 minute burst and uh, in my eight year old body feeling what, you know, what does the pool feel around me? I was in one of those rings and floating and I was, was gonna be a race. And so I, I put myself in that moment, in that memory. And I think that gets us right back into the heart of our childhood and those, those moments that we felt so deeply. You know, the first time I showed up in seventh grade and the principal decided to introduce me to the whole all white school at the same time. Um, I put myself in that 11, 12 year old skin standing in front of all of those eyes as the first brown person in their school. Uh, and I could write that scene and that taps me back into the, again, it's that time, those times of intensity, whether it be joy, sorrow, struggle, that really inform uh, our voice. So I would go back into one of those memories. Um, I, yeah, I agree. And I, I love that place has been, a way, has been sort of a portal for you um, to talk about your story and those moments, your immigrant story, and and how you your point of view of how you how you see yourself in this world. Yeah, you want me to talk about place? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I love place. Oh, I just love it so much. I I am a five senses person. I uh, so I don't really like movies stories through movies as well because they're stuck with 
two senses, right? And uh, those of us who write, we have access to the reader's imagination, which means we have access to all of their history of their five senses. So when we write a scene, we can actually leave room for the reader to add in the smells and the tastes and the sounds and the smell, all of those five senses, right? I'm tactile, I, I really love smell. So uh, that's why I don't do fantasy. I wish I could write fantasy, but then I would have to world build in all five senses. And I don't know, that's daunting for me. So I write about places I've lived and loved and cried and laughed. And those are the places I set myself, set my characters in. Um, and I go there in my imagination first. In this scene, in any scene that you write, I would say go yourself there first, that place with all five of your senses, because your imagination will feed the scene behind, behind the scene um, in a way that your reader can then receive it and add their own imagination behind the scene. So I would go there first before I do my 10 minute burst. I think, well, what am I smelling? What am I seeing? What does the wind feel like on my skin? What does the air smell like? What is the you know, all those things. And then I would begin to write once I've done that work of imagination. Those details um, that come to us from place are what make a scene come alive and make it feel personal. Um, I, you know, the concrete details are always, um, always so important. And, yeah. and also a way in. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Um, you know, it's just a way in for us as writers when we are stuck to start hone in on those details hone in on that place and what that place offers. The first thing that Tally said was connecting emotion with place. Um, that to me is at the heart of each scene is what emotion is my character feeling right now in this place that she or he is in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so for example, if your character is feeling um, a, a deep disappointment, you, you don't necessarily want to have them be in a wildflower uh, meadow with uh, you know sun beaming on their skin. You, you can use place so well, which is what with all five senses to echo and um, so the reader feels it in their gut, right? With those details, you're talking about concrete details. So you don't have a bunny hopping by in that scene. You know, you know, in a meadow, you you hopefully are writing setting a place where that, that makes the reader feel that emotion in their gut. So yeah, definitely. And the, and it's all about nouns and verbs. You know, adverbs and adjectives are overrated as you, as we know so that the tools of that are good strong i have i read my reread my novels now and i think like it i see a line that like i sniff the fresh ripe fruit and i think why did i say fruit now, this is in india i should have said mango mm -hmm. I, I see nouns that i could have replaced that would have been better nouns even in my finished novels especially of course we, i look at all my past books and think oh what yeah. did i but why did I do, but my craft is growing, I'm improving, I'm getting, I'm going to get better. That's what I, that's the hope is I would put mango in there now. I, I do feel sort of sorry for the adverb. Um, I mean, I know that you should never say anything with a Lee, but, but I feel like sometimes I would like to use some adverbs. Yeah, um, underrated. Well, you know, uh, J.K. Rowling adds adverbs to all her, all her descriptions. Pleadingly, uh, Harry said stubbornly. You know, she has those L-Y verbs uh, on the descriptions. I, I like descriptions to just be said. I'm really, I'm pretty spare in my writing. I don't, in my, in my fiction writing, but, and that's maybe a matter of style, but I think they should be sparing. It's like, if there's too too much use of whereas nouns and verbs you can go you can go crazy with them. well verbs should be sparing too like you don't want to have somebody bounding and then jogging and then jump you know those but nouns I feel can always be you can go crazy with nouns I I think this I is think right. This, right her her voice her voice oh I'm getting an echo her voice has been her voice using adverbs it people responded to that in a really interesting way. Um, and so it invited me to play with words that normally I would have pushed to the side. Maybe they did not make the cut, but they were words that helped me explore um, the emotions of the scenes I was creating at that time. Um, I love how you give us permission to make mistakes, Sarah. That's one of your dear traits, permission to learn through mistakes. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have to, because we are all learning and all of our books are, all of our books show us growing.
and experiencing and remembering new things. Um, let's, let's last just talk a little bit about, because your books feel so personal about your family and the importance of family to your, um, to your stories. Yes, family. Uh, I, I, was, we, I was on tour with uh, several authors and somebody was asking us about uh, sort of our, oh, oh, it was being able to pitch ourselves as uh, so-and-so writes about blank, blank, blank. And I was stumped. I was like, what the heck? And you've heard also like, you can pitch your novel as the intersection of two pop culture things. And, and there's these writers that are so good at like, oh, my book is a mix of, of you know, whatever, uh, Schitt's Creek with this and that. And I'm thinking, how do people come up with it? So I did not know what my theme, writing theme was. And then I think it was Anna Marie McElmore who's come to hi hi highlight. She said, oh, Matali, I know it's about community, family, village. And I thought, oh my gosh, she's right. That's exactly yeah. what I write about. So, um, Definitely, that is my, where I circle around. Everybody has, there's always generations, everybody has connections. And, you know, I come from a culture where I have 22 first cousins, Bengali culture, and um, everybody calls each other by different, by different names. So I have my mother's youngest uncle, my mother's youngest, my mother's youngest brother is my Choto mama. My mother's next youngest brother is my Mejo mama. And they would all call me by different terms. So I get called, when I go back to, to India, I get called maybe 40 different nicknames that, by different people. So that connection by name, like the relationship, I call this, my father's uncle has a different name. And so if I say my Borojetu, that means my father's oldest brother. And it's just that such a connectional culture. It's deeply in my, in my roots and I'm so grateful for it. I feel like it's something that's really lacking, that village connection in American cultures, I feel like it's part of my offering as an immigrant to this new place is that value of, uh, you know, that deep connection that we have with our joint family and also with people in our, whatever our villages are. So that's something I, I'm finally bringing up to the surface and saying, this is part of my contribution. I hope, I pray it is. Yeah. And I think as um, I'm so grateful to the Own Voices movement that has brought so many stories from cultures and families that are not like my family for me to read in my home and get to know. I mean, that has been, that I feel like I've, I've met the world in a way. Right, Sarah. And you know, you, you're, you're Jewish, so you know that that's such a strong part of your heritage, right? That connection to the past. And yeah. you talk about your mom and all. I know, I know uh, that's a very strong part of your culture as well. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, it's something that's lacking in America. There's a hunger, a hunger here for connection to the past, for heritage. You see it in that upswing in DNA search. You know, people who just don't want to be defined by a color. They want to be defined by a culture because they're, they're, they're away, they've moved away from, they don't know what they, who they are, what their languages their great-great-grandparents spoke. Um, and so there's this hunger for that. And I think that these books, that's why maybe there is a longing to read about books from other cultures because there's that connection back to the villages. I always say, go, you know, that can, I'm, I'm only one generation from the jute farm. In fact, where we moved, uh, we moved into a multi-generational housing situation. My mom, our sons, I'm kind of back to the jute farm here in California. That's <laughs> so cool. Yeah. I don't know that my mom would do that. <laughs> <laughs> different kitchens all need different Oh, kitchens. that's important. Although, although I think my mother would let me cook. My mom was not, um, my, my mother was not a, um, uh, an enthusiastic chef growing yeah, up. Oh, really? oh. See, my mother was, you can tell. <laughs> but I, she, still, she still cooks for us. But I, I, uh, it's, it's true that my joint family, my uncles all lived in a joint family and, uh, in Calcutta. And as soon as they got different kitchens, everybody got along so much better after that. Amazing. <laughs> I think, I think most of my culture is based around kugel. Like, what oh. kind of kugel do you make? Do you like sweet kugel or do you like, or do you That's like- a great icebreaker. Great? I gotta use that. Hey, what kind of kugel do you like? I'll use that next time. People will be so impressed with my insider cultural references. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I think it is time for us to switch to the lightning round. Here we go. These are quickie questions, like bursts. Pen, pencil, or straight to the keyboard? 
pen and pencil for prayers and poetry, and keyboard for nonfiction and fiction. Scrivener or note cards? Ew, neither. I'm a note card person. Um, first book that you ever loved? I started reading when I was up oh, three, so I was an early reader. I remember reading Babar. I know it's not culturally appropriate, but I did love Babar the Elephant. I think that maybe the cultural journeying, which is so messed up in Babar now, but yeah, I read Babar when I, I was three. Loved it. I found a first edition Babar in French. Oh, wow. I had That's to. Ooh, it's a beautiful wow. book. It's a beautiful it's giant. My favorite book, everybody knows, my favorite book is The Carrot Seed. I think it's like the story of, of writing is yeah. The Carrot Seed of Determination. Chocolate cake, apple pie, or something else? Potato chips. Always potato chips. Savory girl right here. No, no sweet I, tooth. Okay. Hmm. Um, do you, um, hiking or biking or forget it, let's stay at home. Hiking. Oh my gosh. You can follow me on, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and come with me on my hikes. I'm always posting pictures of my gorgeous hikes here in the California Hills. It, it's beautiful there. It's beautiful. I lived in Palo Alto in, um, in the early nineties. And yeah, that's, uh, wait, no, I was gone there from there by then. The early 90s, <laughs> that sounds like yesterday. <laughs> Yikes. Um, what, um, what's the job you always leave for last? Uh, what's the, um, oh, all that business of writing, the Excel spreadsheets and keeping track of my expenses. Ugh, ugh, I hate yeah. that stuff. Um, and what frivolous thing do you miss the most? What's the first thing you're going to do when you, when this is all, all, all done? Travel. Oh, I love to travel. I love crossing borders. I'm, I hope travel continues to be. I, uh, I hope so too. I was supposed to be getting back from Greece. Oh, it's brutal. Painful. Sorry. Have some Kugel. Have some Kugel. I'm going to have some Kugel. Let's take some questions from the group. Um, from Judy Bateman, I want to write about early years in school, but I'd prefer that it be fiction. What is your yeah. suggestion? Absolutely, Judy. I would say that's exactly what I, I, I fictionalize everything. It's, it's a, so I would say go back to your memory first and then in the revision, just play. Fiction gives us license to lie, which is the only time, the only time we have that license. So. Uh, I'd start with the memory, though, if you'd like to go back to your early years and t tap into some strong emotion, write that, dr that draft of a memory, and then bring it in. The fiction is fun. Make it whatever you, take it whatever direction you want to go. Um, Linda Marshall loves the different terms for family. Um, uh, is there a term in your language for the relationship between your parents and your partner's parents? Ah... She's got, um, she's got the Yiddish for it, but I, I know I'm going to butcher the pronunciation. Oh, let's hear it. Try it, Sarah. I think it's Mahajunista or something like oh. that, or yes. the, um, the, the, um, the parents, the in-laws. Yes. So uh, in my culture, it would be, you would say, my mom calls her my shashari. So she, it's more older, younger. Cultures are so interesting. They show the values. And so my mother would call someone, she would, she would refer to my relationship with my mother-in-law. She would say, have you called your shashari? So she would use the term that I'm supposed to use because she's older than me. And now I know comadre in Spanish. So I think that's very telling when a culture does have that word of, you know, like my comadre would be if and when, hear my prayer of God, my sons ever do get married. There, that my, my daughter-in-law's mother would be my comadre, which is a beautiful word if you think about it. And compadre, you know, it's, it's that you're, you're joined together to help raise the grandchildren. So I love that word. I, I will probably have to invent a word with whatever culture my, my, my sons marry into. Maybe they'll come with it. Maybe I'll get that Yiddish word, which would be great. Yid I mean, Yiddish is... Yiddish, Yiddish is, is fabulous. It's it is fabulous. It's fabulous. I know you're such a mensch, Sarah. You're such a mensch. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the nicest thing a human being can say. Yeah, yeah. Um, in um, new picture books, this is a question from Bruce. 
new picture books are now how many words? Um, what are, are we going? Are we going smaller? Are we going longer? Um, do we have permission to do whatever? Um, um, what are, are do you have any um, suggestions or tips or tips for um, word uh, for shorter books for picture books? Right. Uh, yes, I think we need to leave lots of room for the illustrator. I've just my second picture book is coming out uh, next year, uh, and I've been so delighted. It's like an architect and an interior designer. Like you build a house with your words, and then you leave it. You come back in after the designer and the furnishings are in, and you think. Oh my gosh, this is gorgeous. Is this the same house? So you really have to leave room for the artist. Uh, but I would say it's still that same thing. It's three acts. My editor, Grace Kendall with Macmillan, if you follow her on Instagram, she just did this little video or, or Twitter on, on this three act structure of a picture book. I would say if you hit the three act structure and you stick to that, that dummy, that, that same structure of picture books, and then you're just brutal about leaving room um, in that revision for the art, uh, it's not a word count so much to me as it is leaving space for the artist and doing that three art three act structure in any in a fiction picture book. Yeah, even in a even in nonfiction, that um, that the 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 why and the and the so what and the essential element of the of the story that you're telling a life isn't a story. Your picture book has to be a story, and. And that, that is the, that's what makes it a puzzle. You know, that is interesting. I don't know. Or I have a picture book coming like, out like, as well um, called yeah. Brand New Bubby. And finding that language and leaving room, I can't wait to see what's going to happen with it. It is, um, it starts with words, but when it's finished, people find it through the illustrations. Yeah, the design of the book, the font choice. I mean, I am not an artist, uh, a visual artist, so I'm the kind of person that goes, wow, when you doodle anything, you know? So for me to see my story uh, beautifully designed and illustrated, it's like magic, Sarah. You're gonna have so much fun seeing that, Bubby. I can't wait. And, and I think, Bruce, if, you, um, if you're worried about word count, the best thing you can do is make a dummy and really make the dummy so that it feels, looks like, and turns pages like a book. And then look and read it out loud and say, am I getting impatient for that page turn? Because if you are, you have too many words. And even though the art director and the illustrator are going to paginate your book all by themselves, your playing in that way will help you to figure out um, what is, um, what, where to cut, where to artfully cut. And um, I guess we're going to also say you can start with those adverbs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so last question. Um, what are you reading and what are you loving right now? Are any, any books that we should have our eyes on? Oh, gosh. Well, I just unpacked so many books. You can see my, I have a shelf here. The top shelf is the books that I've been wanting to, that are my to do, to, to read list. So I can just call it some of those titles. There's uh, 24 Hours in Nowhere by Dusty Bowling is on there. I've got um, Front Desk by Kelly. I haven't read that one yet. I'm writing middle grade next. So I'm trying to read a lot of middle grade. So I've got all of those reads on the top. Oh, there's Torpedoed by Deborah Heiligman. Um, so I'm- I loved that book. Yeah. Those it are was, I read it right before we stayed home. And I'm glad that I, you know, tough, I, yeah. tough book. Um, I want to um, recommend Friend or Fiction, Fun by Abby Cooper. I also want to recommend if you need some, oh, I don't think I brought it with me over here. If you need some inspiration, The Velocity of Being and its letters written by all kinds of creators um, to readers. And it is absolutely um, inspiring. And then I'm just reading this nonfiction book called Your Blue Flame by Jennifer Fulweiler. And it's a uh, uh, subtitle, Drop the Guilt and Do What Makes You Come Alive. Sort of like figuring out what your vocation, what you're, how you're supposed to serve the planet, as we were talking about earlier. So I haven't read it yet, but I love Jen Fulweiler's radio show. In fact, I'm going to be on it next, this Thursday. So I'm reading that. But it's really inspiring, uh, the big picture of why we write and what we're trying to do. 
That, that sounds great. Um, Anjali has one last question. How hard was it when you began to write books that were new in their stories and themes? Did you feel like you were creating a new path? Oh gosh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, did, I wasn't really thinking about it, but I think in a sense I was. The market really wasn't open to immigrant stories, at least the children's market back then. Um, people, I would hear things like, oh, you know, American, you got to put an American character in there, meaning white if you travel overseas, like my rich out girl, bamboo people, tiger boy are all fully set overseas with no white American characters. And those got roundly rejected, partly because they were looking for some, you know, American to travel there. And then they felt the child reader could really need that bridge character help, which is a bunch of crock really, because children are so much more better, so much better at traveling than adults. So, yeah. um, so yeah, I think I was forging a path. I was a path forger. Looking back, I was just getting rejected like a crazy person. Uh, so hopefully maybe people can say, hey, Rickshaw Girl sold some copies. So maybe you'll accept this global book that, and take a chance on it. And um, so hopefully there'll be, a, maybe I can be a comp for some of you or try to write something that is not traditionally, you know, market. At those, that was a stage there where my husband was like, why don't you set a zombie in, in Bangladesh? I think that'll pay, maybe that'll pay for the boys' college tuition, you know, like, so. Anyway. Um, I, I, do, I totally agree in terms of um, Jewish stories. Um, that in, when I first started writing, um, that the Jewish story, that the only Jewish story that anybody wanted to hear was a Holocaust story. They didn't want, they, nobody seemed to want a story about a kid who was Jewish, whose Judaism was just part of the picture. And that now it's amazing that the, the reading I'm doing, so many great Jewish stories coming out and so many stories about things other than bar mitzvah or, or you know, the, the horror of World War II, that um, it's really like, it's exciting to me that we can explore who we are um, and, and really get to, that, get to that very personal place, which really all books are. We're all forging that path because we're all so unique um, and have something new to say to our young readers.